Well, good morning and welcome. Good morning. So glad that we've gathered here to worship together. We are starting out our uh, worship today with a baptism.
If you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Morning, church. This morning I'm reading from Luke chapter 3, verses 7 to 14. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say, your, say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. May God bless the reading of his word. Are you ready? I mean, are you prepared? There's a show called Doomsday Preppers. I don't know if you've seen it. It's on National Geographic or some such channel. These people are crazy. They got people who are saving seas. They got people who have these underground bunkers. There are people who, well, these are less crazy people. They're growing their own food and stuff like that. I guess that, that's not that out of the question. But, you know, they, they believe that the world is going to end somehow and that they're going to be saved by the stuff that they're keeping there. I don't know. I, I always think, what if I'm uh, on vacation when all this happens and I can't get to my bunker? Well, somebody will find it, I guess, and it'll be okay. You know, but uh, <clears throat> I do believe in being ready. I grew up in Miami where hurricanes hit us. And so we always had to have batteries for our flashlights and our radios. And we always had to have uh, uh, candles, you know, from the fire went out. And when we knew the hurricane was coming, we filled our bathtubs <laughs> with water. And so there's there things we always did, you know. You, there's, in, my, in my truck, I have a first aid kit, which uh, unfortunately comes in handy every once in a while. I have a spare tire, just in case my phone doesn't work to get somebody to come over here and change my tire. But, uh, so you know, I, I, I do believe in preparation, and I have some preparation that I do, that I recommend you do. FEMA recommends that you have three days worth of stuff. Now, the people, on Doomsday Prepper, they'll laugh at that. But I was actually in a national emergency in Hurricane Katrina, and wouldn't you know it, it took three days for FEMA to get there with all their equipment, and they were there and they were putting stuff out. It was amazing. It was amazing how that could happen. So I'm not worried about physical preparation. I know I'm okay. I've got enough peanut butter and jelly to last me. <laughs> I may not have enough bread, but I got the peanut butter and jelly. You know, you put peanut butter on one finger, jelly on the other. <laughs> you know, you're good to go. <clears throat> I have a lot more survival tips later. Now, one of the important things about getting ready was warnings. I, as a little child, I knew that two red flags with black center square flags, that that was a hurricane warning. And I forgot, but I, I didn't forget. It's just that I've, I've learned how to just watch TV and they'll tell me. I don't need to be looking at flags. But I used to remember what the flags were, whether it's a watch or a warning and what that meant. You know, warning is the only one that I'm worried about. If we're watching a hurricane, that's okay. I just watch it on TV. But the warning is there. That's the time when you fill your bathtubs. In Illinois, we didn't have hurricanes. We had tornadoes. So we had this big blasting siren. <laughs> And then we had to go to the basement. So we came to San Antonio. You know tornadoes come to San Antonio? 
and we don't have a basement, Tracy and I are in a panic. We're always prepared for everything, and we don't know where we're going to go. If the, well, we found out, you go under the stairs. You know, even in Illinois, we were supposed to go under the, in the basement, you would go under the stairs. That would be the safest place in the basement. Uh, Dylan, you know, when, uh, when he was very little, Tracy taught him, you know, if the tornado hits the house, we go under the stairs. Dylan thought that's so we could hide, so the tornado wouldn't find us. <laughs> The warnings are important, but the reality is when we, we may not get a warning. But we're getting a warning now. John the Baptist is warning us. John the Baptist is preparing the way for the Lord. He's telling us to prepare our hearts. By failing to prepare, we are preparing to fail. So I recommend to you that you have a little bit extra. Somebody told me today that they have a jacket in their car because you never know what the weather's going to be in San Antonio, except in July. You know what's going to be in July. But this time of year, you know, I've been very cold. Uh, well, not this time of year. I've been very cold in May when I found myself without a jacket and short sleeve shirts because I thought if it's going to be 80 at 1, it probably isn't going to be 50 at uh, 8 a.m. But it was. I was not prepared, and I paid a price. Not a heavy price. I just got a little cold. John doesn't tell people to prepare their things or their bodies. He tells them to prepare their hearts. Prepare your heart for the coming storm. Some folks in John's day believed that their status would save them. They were God's chosen people. They followed the rules. They believed that they were safe. But John said that they were not bearing good fruit. That their actions told the real story of the condition of their heart. We know that uh, Jesus would talk about how what's in your heart comes out of your mouth. So your actions are betraying your heart no matter how much you believe or say you believe or how many rituals you go through. Material possessions will save you. I don't care if you have annuities, gold, a cabin in the woods, or a bunker in your basement. These things will save you. Like I said, you might be on vacation. You've got this great room in your house, a safe room, lined in metal, protected from the fallout, stocked with all kinds of water and food, and you might be on a cruise ship when the nukes hit or whatever it is that you're preparing for. It won't save you. The whole economy collapsed. What are you going to do with your uh, bank account? Okay, you've got gold, right? What are you going to do with that gold? You can't eat it. <laughs> and I'm sure that people who have food might trade their food for your gold or your silver uh, coins or something, maybe. But there's going to come a time when they, they're going to have all the silver and they're going to realize that you can't eat silver. So your material stuff's not going to save you. And you can't take it with you either. Now, I'm not saying clean out your bank account. I'm not saying that. You want to have a bank account. You want to be prepared financially, but don't rely on that for your salvation. You know, the richest man in town died and the reporter came and asked his lawyer, how much did he leave? The lawyer said, all of it. We're not going to take it with us. Religious rituals aren't going to save you either. I know that we have this tradition in Baptist churches particularly, where you walk down the aisle and you go in the water. Those things are important. But salvation is in Jesus Christ, not in the ritual itself. You're not gonna, we're not going to be saved by rituals. We're not going to be saved... We are saved by faith. And even that's not ourselves. It is a gift from God. So we need to prepare our hearts for the coming storm. We prepare by practicing compassion, John will tell us. The cross asked John, what should I do? He said, whoever has two tunics, share with him who has none. Whoever has food, do likewise. We prepare by sharing the things that God has blessed us with by blessing others with these things. 
God owns everything. Everything. We're simply stewards of his possessions. We have, if we have more than we need, I believe it's so we can exercise generosity towards another person. You know, there's no lack of food or basic supplies in the way in the world. There is not. There's no such thing as famine the way there was once famine. Famine is regionalized. There may be no food in Ethiopia, but there's plenty of food in Russia, plenty of food in America, plenty of food all around. It's just a matter of distribution and getting it there. So hunger in the world is not a sin in and of itself. The greed is, and the lack of distribution is, in the in Somalia. You probably saw the movie Black Hawk, uh, Black Hawk Down. We have all this food coming in there in little boxes, you know, peanut butter and jelly with bread. It's all going to this country, and the warlords step in and seize the food. They say that food belongs to the warlord, and he decides who eats and who doesn't. That is the sin of the world, not the fact that there's hunger. The food was there. It's just somebody was preventing the people who needed it from getting it. We have a distribution problem. But it's not even that drastic. Maybe we have things that we don't need that we're not sharing. If you have two coats, share with one who doesn't have a coat. You know, it, we used to make fun of women because they would have all these shoes, right? Different shoes to match different outfits, and we thought that was so wasteful. And so what's the answer to that? Men now have more shoes than they can wear. Well, men are more practical. I mean, we, 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 I have shoes that I walk in, shoes that I run in, and we have shoes for tennis. And, you know, that's different. If you play football, you have like five different pairs of cleats depending on the weather. But seriously, we have an abundance. Now, uh, forgive me football players out there. I know you need these shoes. Those are your tools. And sometimes we have different shoes because they're our tools. But we certainly have more in our closets that we're going to use. You know, uh, one of the... Uh, there was a, a missionary to China. Hudson Taylor, who every year he would lay out all the possessions he had on his bed. And he didn't have that much. And if he saw something he hadn't been using in a year, he would give it away. Because he figured he was keeping it for somebody who needed it. He didn't need it. Now I know, I know this is hard because I am that guy. I'm the one that has all those pieces of wood because I might need them someday. And screws and bolts and stuff like that. Sometimes we have stuff like that, and sometimes we do use it. But if we have something that we know we're not going to use, and by the way, I needed some of those nuts and bolts I was saving, and I couldn't find where I put them. <laughs> it's me. So sometimes even when we try to keep stuff, it doesn't help us. But <clears throat> we, there's no security in it. When Hudson Taylor gave away something that he wasn't using, he did that in the knowledge that if he needed it, God would provide. God would provide. <clears throat> Helping the poor with our excess possessions, even with our sacrificial possessions, shouldn't be just, you know, sometimes we might need to give that person our only coat. That was, goes all the way back to the Old Testament. In Leviticus it says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field <clears throat> or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them on the floor for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. <clears throat> we always seem to have more than we need. This is uh, yesterday. We were, I was at a teaching on the book of Titus. I was part of a team teaching situation. And one of the teachers talked about margins. I'm a strong believer in marginal time. I don't want to make my appointments one after another because I don't want to rush out of something and say, look, i got to go, I don't have time. And I also don't want to get on the highway and be rushing to my appointment and get into an accident. So I always believe in marginal time. It, that is a way to control your blood pressure. 
Now he talked about marginal money. He talked about setting aside money so that you can use you, you're by setting aside marginal time and marginal finances, you can be a blessing to another person. Now God blesses us differently in terms of finances. Some will have more money than others, and a lot of it has to do with how old you are and what, what place you are in life. But everybody has a little bit that they can keep aside. We don't have to spend every penny that we have. I know some of that's hot, right? It starts burning a hole in your pocket. You know, that's not true. And if it is, well, get yourself a little coin purse, and that'll protect your pocket. But we don't have to spend every penny. We don't have to use up every bit of our time. Slow down. Have marginal time so you can bless others. God is the one who provides. And if, he, if you have a need that God is blessing, He will resupply you. So we prepare our hearts by practicing compassion. We also prepare our hearts by practicing honesty. You know, it's amazing to me that there were tax collectors who came to John the Baptist. And the tax collectors who came to be baptized said, what shall we do? And he said, collect no more than you are authorized to do. This is a strange thing. You all know about tax collectors, right? Back in the Roman times, they collected taxes for the Roman government and they needed to collect a quota but they were allowed to keep everything extra they collected, a fee. We see that all the time. You go take out a loan and you have to pay the loan back. You got to pay the interest back. And then they got these fees that you got to pay too. They're always, they have many ways of getting you. The way the Roman tax collectors would get you is by charging you as much as they can get away with. It's amazing. John is not saying, hey, don't be a tax collector, you collaborator. You're just helping the Romans. You're paying for that army that's occupying us. He didn't say that. He didn't say, work for free. He didn't say, quit your job. He didn't say, keep your job, but work for free, don't collect fees. He said, do not collect more fees than you ought to. It's expected that you're going to collect a fee. By the way, I know some of you are thinking, man, I'd like to be one of the Roman tax collectors. Wow. You have to pay to buy that license. They just don't give it to you. You gotta pay. So you gotta pay, so you gotta raise the money. You probably had to borrow money. So it was a business. And John is not telling him, hey, just be honest is what he's telling them. Collect your fees. Honesty was the key here. Nothing else, not politics. Honesty. <clears throat> Business today can be the same. You can pad your bills. You can agree with someone for a certain price. And then once the agreement is made, when you give them the bill, there's a couple of fees. Now I know the cable company. Everybody hates the cable company. It's like the tax collectors of today. They will give you, you will, you're going to get your cable for $100 a month. What a bargain, right? But then when you look, there's this tax and that tax and that fee and the other fee. And all those are on us. When you think about it, the taxes, they're not pocketing taxes. But they're not telling you. So you've got to be careful. Is that dishonest? I'm not sure. The most honest thing I could tell you would be how much it's going to cost out of your pocket not try to lure you in with a hundred dollars a month sometimes unnecessary work is done you know you're working on somebody's car and they need this fixed and you know you upsell them okay I'm gonna fix this that and the other thing but it's not upselling if they don't know that you're doing it and you and they don't need it you know, you walk into McDonald's and you're going to buy a burger and they want to say, you want fries with that? How about a drink? That's called upsell. That's honest and open, sort of, I guess. They've certainly trained us to have to have fries with our burgers. You know, you don't have to do that. I don't know if you knew that. There's no law. 
but we want it. But sometimes where, where it's wrong, where it's dishonest, is where you're getting sold things that you didn't need, didn't want, didn't ask for. Covering up flaws is another way, another dishonest business practice where you paint over something that has a flaw in it or, you know, used car dealers are famous for that. You go into a used car dealership and especially when the cars are kind of cheap and there was all kinds of tricks that people used to do. I don't know if they work anymore. I mean, everybody knows, hopefully everybody knows the tricks. Just have your car checked out by a mechanic. You won't, you can't go wrong that way. Well, I hope you can't go wrong that way. What we need to do in our business practices is be open and honest and not try to take a shortcut. I mean, let's face it, we're not going to become millionaires by selling, by lying about the condition of our car or by padding the bills or by trying to get money that doesn't belong to us. The gospel the good news is that cheaters can become honest through the power and the grace of God. One of these tax collectors named Zacchaeus, in fact, he was a chief tax collector. I don't know what that means. It means like maybe he's a mafia don. I don't know. He's a chief tax collector. He stood and said to the Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusations, I will return fourfold. That, by the way, is the law in the Old Testament. If you stole from somebody, you had to pay back four times. He said if he stole, he's going to pay back four times and he's going to give half his money. Now, honestly, I don't think that Zacchaeus giving up half his money was going to make him poor. He probably had plenty of money. But instead of hoarding it, He's going to share it with everybody. And you know what Jesus said? He said, today salvation has come into this house. This turning of the heart was proven financially. Zacchaeus' heart was turned and he proved it by giving money to the poor. Today salvation has come into this house. So we prepare through compassion. We prepare our hearts by being honest, and we prepare our hearts by not abusing our power. The soldiers also asked him, and what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation. Be content with your wages. Again, isn't this amazing? He didn't tell the soldiers, hey, put down your arms. That's a terrible thing to a terrible way to make a living. Put down your arms. He didn't tell them that. He told them not to be dishonest, not to abuse their power. You know, everyone has a level of power over somebody else. I don't care who you are. You walk into a fast food place and you have power over the people behind the counter. You can be as abusive as you want to them and they'll be nice to you, they'll be kind to you, as long as you leave your money doesn't mean that you're not hurting their feelings. Everybody has power over somebody. I remember this one guy, he was really having a bad day at work. You know, the boss was a real jerk, always demanding things of him, always treating him badly. He comes home all dejected. His wife, she tries to comfort him and says, Oh, honey, you may be at the bottom of the total pull at work, but here you're second in command. <laughs> Man, uh, Jesus said that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lorded over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It amazes me how much people want to remind you of their power and authority all over the place. It's kind of sad 
you know. I know that doctors deserve respect and they work hard to become doctors, but you know, they insist that you, they, they're called doctor. They, they are known by their position in life. And I suppose that's okay. And, and that's the, probably the most exaggerated one, but constantly people are trying to show you their rank and show you how powerful they are. You know what comforts me? What comforts me is I look at people like that and I think they have really low self-esteem. All they are is a title. They don't have enough personal power, prestige, or confidence to be able to do away with their title. <coughs> Maybe I'm wrong, but it just makes me feel better. Jesus said, don't do that. Don't get the big office that shows your power. Don't sit behind the big desk. Don't give yourselves titles. Don't have special parking spots. Don't wear certain types of uniforms that show your rank. See, sometimes in society, only people with rank could wear certain types of clothes. So don't do any of these things. Whoever wants to be great among you must make themselves like a child, he would say. He's, be like Jesus, who came to serve, not to be served. Never, everybody has a level of power over somebody else. Whoever you have power over, surrender that power. Become their servant. Be nice to the person behind that counter. Be nice to the person who made a mistake trying to serve you. People make mistakes. Jesus also said, blessed are the peacemakers. He said to love your enemies. Do not resist an evil person, he said. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go a mile, go with them two miles. You know, it's a very complicated passage. It really is, because we don't want to do that. We, and we try to explain it away. You know, we, it's, I've heard so many preachers try to explain this away. So I'm going to explain it away too. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to explain it away. I'm just going to leave it right there. Jesus said, if somebody slaps you, turn the other cheek. That's what he said. That's all he said. I don't need to explain that. You need to just figure out what that means for you. You need to figure out what that means for you. Because we... Uh, we believe the opposite. If somebody cuts you off in traffic, cut them off as well. And I think what Jesus might say, if somebody cuts you off in traffic, back up a little bit and let the next guy in too. Our power must be the power of God to override our own desires and honor Him. He told the soldiers to learn to be content. Jesus will say it this way. Don't worry. Asking, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you as well. Therefore don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about its own things. There's, you got enough trouble today. You know, I heard somebody say one time that today I have everything I need. Everything I need for this moment, I have. I don't need anything else. You realize that? Think about it right now. Right now, this moment, every one of you has everything you need. You're breathing, you're sitting, and you're indoors. That's a lot of stuff. There might be a world of worry waiting for you as soon as you walk out. Or there might not be. But right now you've got everything you need. So take this moment right now when you've got everything you need to thank God and to worship Him for everything you have. I've got something to say to you that some of you might find is bad news. We're all going to die. We're all going to die. And we're going to spend more time dead than we spent alive. That means that we're going to spend more time in eternity than we did on earth. And that's what we need to prepare ourselves for. 
You know, sometimes we prepare for careers, and that's good. You know, we go to school, we go to training, we do this. We prepare ourselves for careers. And then when we have careers, we prepare ourselves for retirement. Isn't that funny? We work hard to get a job. We get a job and we work hard to get out of it. <laughs> Those are good things to prepare for. Put money aside for retirement. The younger you are, even a little bit of money that you put away is going to turn into a fabulous amount of money. Assuming, you know, America's still here, yada, yada, yada. I'm assuming America's going to still be here. But, we are going to spend all of our time in eternity. And that's what we need to prepare ourselves for. And Jesus is coming in this passage here. John the Baptist is telling people to prepare. Prepare by being compassionate. Prepare by being honest. Prepare by, not, by being gentle and not abusive. I think Jesus would come later, and I think he would say it better. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He would also say that love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbors yourself. This is what the gospel, this is what the law and the prophets are all about. Imagine that. Imagine if you were doing unto others the way you would have them to do. We wouldn't need anything else. We'd be ready. We'd be prepared. We're going to listen to another song of worship now. This is an opportunity for you to pull out your communication card here. Share with us what God is telling you. And put it in the offering plate when it comes by later.
There's a popular story in the Gospels that I know you know well. The, there was a, a bunch of people gathered in a field listening to Jesus speaking. It went long and it was getting near supper time. And the disciples were concerned that the people were going to go hungry and they didn't know what to do. They were very concerned. They figured, you know, we need to quit early, let the people go find food. All these people, where are they going to find food? You know, there was no, uh, there was no food courts at the mall, which is, by the way, where a large group of people like that can all get food. But, you know, one, one of the disciples, for some reason, you know, I, I don't know, he got a little boy's lunch, some fish and some bread, just one person's worth of food. And he presented it to Jesus. This is all I could find. It is amazing to me because I don't know what I would have done. I would have said, kid, that's not going to be enough. And I would have just gone to Jesus and handed. But Andrew brings this offering, a tiny offering to Jesus. You know, Jesus was never worried. You know, Jesus was ever worried about anything. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what he could do. He knew, he knew the possibilities. And so he took that amount of food and he blessed it and it multiplied. And there were 12 baskets full of food left after the multitudes were fed. There's multiple miracles here. We need to understand that a little is a lot in God's hands. We need to understand that He is the one that's in charge and He's taking care of these things. God fed those people, but He used the little boy's lunch to do so. He used the faith of Andrew who thought Jesus can do something about this. God has multiplied your tithes and offerings in this church in so many ways, even in ways that there have been an abundance. There's always been an abundance for us. Uh, for some reason, the way God has worked with us is He would give us a lot of money up front. Then the air conditioner would break. I'm very grateful for that. I don't know why, because He could have done it the other way. The air conditioning breaks, we pray, and He gives us some money. He could have done it the other way, but he did. He chose to give us some money first. So that's why I know whenever there's a, a flood of funds that come in for some reason or another, I know what's going to break. <laughs> Actually, I'm saying that now, but what I really say is, how is God going to have us to use this? So as we collect these tithes and offerings, now, I want you to know that God is going to multiply them, and He's got a purpose for that. And we are very good and looking for God's purposes and joining Him in His work. Pray with me. Father, may these <clears throat> offerings that we bring to You today be pleasing in Your sight. Receive them, Lord, from the cheerful hearts that are giving them. And help us, Lord, to continue to be a light in this community and around the world. For this we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
our altar team comes up, we stand ready to pray with you if God has laid a burden on your heart. Perhaps you want God to give you some insight. Perhaps you have something that you need God to work on. However God is, however God is speaking to you, come as we sing.